All right, good to see everybody here tonight. Welcome to the midweek service, and uh, we're honored to have Pastor Bacoli with us. Uh, Bacoli from the Philippines, and uh, Brother Yoder was in his church, uh, preached there. Uh, Mount Bethel Bible Baptist Church, Mount Bethel Baptist Church, Mount Bethel Baptist Church, and uh, remember that because you had chicken fights next to your church and uh not not while we were there but i noticed next door they had a little thing in the back and all that and uh i guess that's is that legal over there or is that illegal it's legal okay and uh is that legal in the united states cockfighting whatever they call it they they had that in south carolina i remember that they didn't uh at least i heard about it i don't know what it was Certainly wasn't something I watched or saw, but I did see that there. And I remember that's from your church. And uh, great to have you with us tonight. Looking forward to having him present and uh, show us a little bit of the work there. Well, we don't need to have a missionary letter tonight. We got a real live missionary, all right? And uh, we're looking forward to hearing from the pastor tonight. And uh, I want you to come. Uh, he's got a. Uh, PowerPoint presentation, but he's going to talk a little bit to it. You greet everyone, tell us a little bit about the work. You take the next, uh, oh, I don't know, care, 15 minutes or so, and uh, talk about what's going on, do your presentation, and take questions if you want, and uh, anything you feel led to do. All right, you come, my friend. Thank you, sir. Make sure we get a good microphone for him. Where's the good mic? This. Amen. Good evening. I want to thank the Lord for this uh, great opportunity that uh, Dr. Slava gave me. And I really praise the Lord for uh, giving me time to present the ministry back home in the Philippines. This is my uh, one month here in the United States and uh, I'm still uh, finding my English. <laughs> I cannot find my English sometimes. Amen. Uh, so pardon me if I uh, cannot explain uh, my uh, sometimes of my presentation, amen. Anyway, I'm uh, Brother Han Bakoli, a Filipino missionary from the Philippines. I grew up thinking that I was already saved because my father is a pastor, but I realized later that God has no grandchildren, amen. amen. And I need to accept Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And it was uh, April 28, I came to know the Lord as my personal Lord and Savior. After, my, uh, after graduating from high school, uh, the Lord uh, called me to enroll in the uh, Bible seminary. And uh, after I finished my Bible seminary, the Lord called me to be a church planter missionary just like my father. That's why I am a second generation church planter. My father came to know the Lord because of uh, after World War II because of a Baptist missionary, American Baptist missionary that went in our country after World War II. And I really praise the Lord and thank the Lord for sending missionaries after World War II. 
And uh, thank you very much. Be be before I'll go on with my testimony, I just want to thank I just want to thank uh, our friend here in America because you sent 3M in our country. The first M that you sent in our country is the military when we in need of uh, uh, help uh, because we are invaded by the Japanese. So you sent a lot of mission, uh, a lot of soldiers in our country. They shed literally their own blood in our country just to spread us from the Japanese invasion. Thank you very much for your military. And when they went back, because they saw the pe our people there, they have their compassion. So a lot of military went back here. They surrendered their M16, and then they went back to our country, bringing their John 316. That's why my father came to know the Lord. Amen? Amen. They bring their John 316 in our country. The second M that you uh, uh, send in our country is the missionary. And we really thank the Lord. And I can't remember, I, I do not, uh, I, I always remember the person that witnessed to my father, Pastor John McCarthy. And I think the first one that I need to see in heaven is that person, Pastor John McCarthy. And I, I say to him, thank you very much for your, uh, for being in our country after World War II because my father came to know the Lord. I came to, man, to know the Lord. My son came to know the Lord and we're all in the mission, mission field. Amen? And the third M that we love most that you send in our country is the McDonald. Amen? <laughs> Three M, the, the military, missionary, and then McDonald. That's why we have a taste of <laughs> McDonald in our country. Amen? So thank you for the McDonald. Uh, chicken with rice, if you order that. <laughs> Amen. And so that's my, uh, and uh, uh, after graduation from Bible seminary, the, the Lord called me to be a missionary in one town in, of, of our country. And then uh, after uh, six years of being a church planter in that town of Lahore, the Lord called me again to another town. And then, then this is my third church planting ministry that I did in Gabaldon. I went in Gabaldon. I have only one contact, one family in that place. There's no Baptist, uh, Baptist uh, church in that place that time, 2008. And then the Lord uh, allowed me to come here in this country, 2008. But since that time, I've never been here in the United States. So, uh, 10 years. And uh, this is my third church planting ministry. When I came here, 2008, I bring only my faith. We do not have a church uh, lot. We do not have building. But uh, the vision that I share last 2008 is now reality today. Amen. We have now the church lot. 60% uh, of the building is finished. Uh, that's why I'm here to present the 40% to finish that uh, church building so that I'll go again to another place where there's no Baptist church for my fourth church planting ministry. I spent 10 years in this third planting ministry from the scratch. And this is my family. Uh, uh, this is my son. Oh, okay. I think it's off. Jasriel, <laughs> uh, this is Jasriel. This is also a pastor now. He's the, our youth pastor. And this one is newly graduated from Bible Seminary also. My, uh, my son is now uh, here in, also in America and uh, uh, sharing his bar burden also. He got his master and then he'll go back to the Philippines. This coming August 29th, start another work also. And uh, that, uh, the, little, uh, the other boy there is also my son. He's my youth pastor in the church. And this, the lady there is my a newly graduate from Bible school, and he is now teaching in a Bible in Tarlac, Pastor in uh, FBCA in Tarlac. I think Pastor Slaba went there in Tarlac, and he's now teaching there in the Christian school. As I've said, this is my when I came here 2008. I bring only the perspective. We don't have a church lot. We don't have a building. I bring this with my faith, and after. Uh, four years, the Lord uh, answers our prayer. That's the perspective. That this is a perspective. If it is finished, it looks like that. I, uh, 2000, uh, uh, 2000, uh, uh, 2010, 
uh, 10, 12, 2012, the Lord gave us the church, uh, the piece of land that we can build this building. And then the Lord provided us also 60% to start building this building. And 2008, when I went that, to that town, there's no, I, I have only one contact, one family. I did Bible studies, uh, visiting the sick, uh, visiting the senior citizen, and uh, counseling ministry in that year. And also we have children's ministry. We have a lot of children in the Philippines. This is uh, our, uh, one of our daily vacation Bible school. And this is also our Sunday school in our, in our church. We have a lot of children in Gabaldon, in, in, in my place. And because we let them sit down on the floor. This is our Sunday school. This is how we did our Sunday school for children. And this one also is, uh, uh, yeah, that's our uh, Sunday school. Uh, we bring out the chairs. In, uh, from inside and we bring out the chair so that the juniors uh, children can sit outside and this is our chief of police I uh, we really thank the Lord for the opportunity to share the message or share Bible studies uh, at the police station and he gave us and I did all I all I did I did it for six years now and the Lord is so good because uh, This Bible studies, we have now three police, uh, police officers with their family is now a member of our church. Three police officers. This is our Bible studies every Friday. This one is, uh, I think, uh, Brother uh, Yonder met this police officer. This one also is a police officer, and this one is a police officer. And I think you meet or also this one in T Tanawan. Amen? So this three family... Our police officer that came to know the Lord in our Bible studies. This is our young people. Uh, and sometimes we have monthly uh, prayer with the young people. And after we pray, they sleep in, in our church. We just uh, put uh, a little bit <laughs> in the floor and then they sleep it in the floor. Uh, we have also the privilege to... Uh, teach our the uh, the drug dependent in our country. At, uh, this is our the drug addicts, and when we share the word of God, Jesus Christ is the only way they can change their lives from drug addicts. And a lot of them came to know the Lord as their personal Lord and Savior. And uh, four family came to know the Lord also, and they are now attending in our church. We baptize that four family. Uh, that uh, the product of our uh, drug ministry. We have team building for the drug addicts. All of that are the drug addicts in our town in Gabaldon. This one also is uh, one of our uh, evening service. We baptize in the river. That's how we baptize. Amen. And sometimes in Dingalan, in the Pacific Ocean. Amen. We baptize in Pacific Ocean. We don't have baptistry in our church. This is our one of uh, our uh, worship service, uh, worship service adult attendance, amen. And a lot of them, some some of them are standing around. And this is our one of our worship service. This is our uh, evening service. Uh, and can you recognize that man? That's Pastor Yoder. Amen. That's our prayer meeting. He's speaking our prayer meeting, Pastor Yoder. Thank you very much. And uh, that's an evening service. Attendance during our prayer meeting. This is our attendance every Sunday, Sunday our ch uh, uh, children's at the outside. And then church retreat. This is my car. Uh, yeah, uh, church retreat. That's how we have our uh, church retreat. Um, beloved, the Lord is uh, uh, good. He allowed me to come here again in your country. And uh, my goal is to raise uh, $14,000 to finish the building, the fence, and then we can put a, a, a parsonage at the back of that church building. 
Because literally we live in the church. We divide the church and at the back of the pulpit is uh, just like this. That, that's our uh, f uh, home with my family. Amen. We literally live in the, in the church. My goal is to put up a, a parsonage at the back and also finish the church building. Uh, I'm praying for $14,000 for the finishing of our church building. I have already $3,000. Uh, I have $3,000 that committed. I have only uh, $11,000 that I'm going to raise. I'm, I'm go, uh, and uh, raise, uh, uh, if I did not go uh, get my goal, uh, 14,000, I'll be go, I'm, on, I'm going home this coming first week of September. Getting my goal or not, I'm going home because I miss my ministry, I miss my family. But I really praise the Lord because this, of this opportunity. If you can help me uh, raising that uh, 11,000 more for the church, uh, finishing of the church, putting a little bit of uh, 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 pastoral house at the back, I really appreciate it. And then that's the time that I'll go back, I'll go again to another church planting ministry. Because I feel that the Lord is calling me as a church planter in our country. I'm also praying that's the building. That, uh, because if the rain comes, coming from that, coming from that, especially during our service, we do not have place to go. All the waters are coming in during our service. So this is my goal, 14,000 to finish this uh, building. Uh, this is the uh, outside. This is the outside. And you can see there, this one. If the rain comes with uh, uh, air, air uh, we, uh, the member, uh, there's no place to go. So that's our, my prayer. And this is also my, our immediate needs, beloved. Please uh, uh, pray for us. We need $1,000 for our monoblock chair. You can see a while ago that a lot of our members are standing around because there's no, we, we, we're lack of uh, chairs in, in, uh, in our uh, church. So this is our immediate needs. Oh, and also the, the children, this, the, just sit down at the floor and then because we bring out the, 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 the chair that's, that uh, was inside the church. So there's no uh, chair. So I'm praying this is our immediate needs because we, we have our anniversary this coming uh, first week of uh, October. And this is our immediate needs, $1,000 for our monoblock plastic chairs and $10 a piece. Uh, so if you can sacrifice your coffee this July for $10, $10 you can help us to buy the 100 pieces of uh, Mundo Black Chair if you can sac sacrifice $10 this month. This month. So we're praying 10, uh, 100 pieces of Mundo Black Chair in our church because of this, uh, because of this uh, crowd. This is a uh, crowd. And this is our children ministry. Don't they, they don't have a, a, a chair to okay. That this one is the what I I call we call that mono black chair. That costs ten dollars a piece. And uh, maybe you can help me. This uh, church can help me to buy that hundred the, the uh, pieces of mono black chair. Amen. And I'm praying also twenty six hundred dollars for my uh, family and ministerial support because after this, after this, after we p finish the church building, uh, I'm I'm going to move again to another town where there's no Baptist church to plant uh, to, to to plant a church again to another town because I feel that the Lord is calling me as a church planter. I train national in our church. He is uh, by profession. He is a nurse, but he is a nurse. But he surrendered his life to be the, the pastor of this church when I leave. So, but my goal before I leave is to finish the building, have a parsonage at the back, and then the 100 pieces of mono black chair. And then that's the time I'm I'm going to move to another town again to plant a church. Amen. So please uh, pray for me. Uh, I'm praying for 20. 
dollars per month. Uh, individual, family, or church that uh, could support me twenty dollars. Thirty churches, family, or individual that could support me twenty dollars per month. And uh, I'm going to move again to another town where there is no Baptist church. So this is my burden, and the Lord allow me for uh, for uh, uh, for the ten years that I cannot, I I, I'm, I I did not came here in the United States. But the Lord is so good; He allow me to come again and present my uh, my burden again. And uh, the Lord is calling me again to another town to uh, have a church planting ministry. So thank you, Pastor Dr. Slava, for allowing me to present my ministry here in your church. I really praise the Lord and uh, thank you for ministering to us in our country. God bless you all. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Anybody have a question for him you want to ask? Anybody curious about anything? Yeah, Brother Bowman. Yes, sir. We have the International Baptist Missions for Asians, and I have my uh, prayer card there. You can see the support address. It was. Uh, it is in Marietta, Ohio. Uh, Marietta, Indep Ohio. Independent Baptist Mission. Independent for Asians. Baptist Mission. Yes. Yeah. Dr. Geiler's agency. That's where he's from. Yeah. Yes, sir. Amen. It's good. Isaac. Oh. The <laughs> Maybe Pastor uh, Dr. Slava can tell you our foods here. Rice. Oh, we, we, <laughs> Rice. We eat dog. <laughs> Everything that creep it, we eat. We, we, we eat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, get, you get rice at McDonald's there, brother. <laughs> and uh, that's good. All right. Pastor, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Pastor. Well, take your Bible this evening, if you would, please, to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, please. Continue our study on the disciples of Jesus this evening. And, uh, by the way, Yoders have their daughter and son-in-law with them. And uh, some of you, I think they were here last Wednesday night. And uh, my brother Teddy goes back home tomorrow. Or t is that right? Tomorrow, this is your last night, right? Oh, okay. All right, good. So uh, he'll have to go back home to Southern California and suffer through that weather, you know, and leave paradise here in Ohio. But uh, it's been great to have you here, Brother Teddy. Thanks for coming. <laughs> uh, amen. And uh, have a safe trip back home. And uh, that's good. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew 9, one verse to look at, and that's verse 9. The Bible says, as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. Now, Father, add your blessing to the reading of this scripture and others that we'll look at tonight as we once again look at one of the twelve men you chose to follow you. And I pray that you'd help us to glean some things tonight from the life of this man called Matthew uh, that will help us to be better followers of you as well. So guide and direct in our study. Holy Spirit, speak to hearts tonight as only you can. It's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Well, nobody of the twelve disciples was as notorious a sinner as Matthew. Now his Jewish name is Levi. Uh, Matthew, Matthew's name means gift of Jehovah. Gift of Jehovah. And although we have a book, we just read a verse from it, the first book of the New Testament named Matthew, uh, that he penned about 20 years after Christ ascended back to heaven, uh, we don't know a whole lot about Matthew himself. And uh, we know that he was a very humble man. He always was in the background, never sought the spotlight at any time. In fact, in all the book of Matthew, all 28 chapters, his name is only mentioned twice. And one of them, 
is right here when Jesus called him. The other time is when he lists the 12 disciples and he mentions his own name. Uh, there's no recorded speech of Matthew in the Bible. No time that he said something. I'm sure he said things, but nothing that made it into Scripture uh, for us to look at. But there are some things that we can learn and we can glean from. Uh, the first thing I want you to notice is his occupation. His occupation. Verse 9 says, he saw a name, man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. The receipt of custom meant Matthew was a tax collector. Okay? He worked for the IRS, if you will, all right? Uh, and as today, he was one of the most despised people in Israel. Publicans were men that would buy tax franchises from the Roman emperor. And uh, that would entail a certain area. And then, basically, they extorted money out of the people of that area. Now, obviously, some went to the Roman government, but a lot went to pad their own pocket. And they would often strong-arm the money out of people if need be. You know, they... Uh, they didn't send Guido to get it, but uh, something like that, okay? Uh, they would have ways to convince you that you need to pay uh, what they're asking you for, even if they, they beat it out of you. So the publicans, most publicans, were pretty much despicable and unprincipled scoundrels, if you will. Uh, in fact, you recall the... In fact, there's only three publicans mentioned in the New Testament. Matthew... Who was the other one? By name, Zacchaeus. And the only other one is Luke 18 when Jesus said a publican and the, 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 a Pharisee and a publican went up to pray. And then the, the publican, it says, stood afar off. And that's important that Jesus would make that statement because they, even though uh, the tax collectors here, and like Matthew's case, Levi, as he would be in his Jewish name, even though he's a Jew, he was not allowed into the court of the temple. He was not even allowed into the... Well, they, they might have let him in the Gentile court, where they would let the Gentiles come in, which was outer court quite a bit away from the actual temple itself. But the publican would even stand outside of there. Even they sometimes weren't even be allowed inside there. He was standing afar off. They were not allowed... Get, in fact, they just kept their distance from about everybody because nobody liked them. They were hated that much. Now, there's two levels of tax collectors. And I'm not sure I'm going to get these names right, but you have it spelled out there in your paper. It's like Gebai and Mokes, M-O-K-H-E-S. The Gebai were the general tax collectors. They collected Property tax, income tax, poll tax, all of those were already set by the Roman government, so there was usually very little corruption among that group of tax collectors. But the ones underneath them, the other group is the Mokes, the M-O-K-H-E-S, and they, they taxed imports, uh, exports, goods for domestic trade, anything that moved by road, uh, they set tolls on the roads, bridges, they taxed beasts of burden, they taxed axles on wagons, they taxed anything they could find. Okay? Uh, that's where the corruption was. Now, under these mokis that they were, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right or not, but there were two groups of mokis. There were the great mokis and the little mokis. Okay? Great ones and little ones. The great Mokis stayed behind the scenes. They hired other people to collect the taxes for them. This probably was the kind of tax collector Zacchaeus was. Had other men working for him. Matthew would have been a little Mokis. Because he had an office where he dealt with people face to face. So Matthew would be one that the people would have resented the most. That was the one that they would have had to argue with and, and, and have confrontations with trying to get the money. So the tax collector would be set apart from people, 
Nobody liked them. Nobody wanted to be around them. And, and, and they were set apart from God. They weren't allowed to go to the temple. If it was church, they would, wouldn't be allowed to come to church. We don't want your kind around here. We don't want you to be in church. So they were banned from the temple. Forbidden to sacrifice. Forbidden to worship. They were outcasts. Now, taxes were collected in three places. Caesarea, Capernaum, and Jericho. If you recall, when Jesus went through Jericho, that's where he met Zacchaeus. So Zacchaeus' area was Jericho. Matthew, his office was in Capernaum. All right, so that was his occupation. So you see, this was a, you talk about the, the lowest, le, lowest, <laughs> lowest part of society that you come from, the one that no one wanted anything to do with, that's the guy Jesus is going to pick to become his follower. It's pretty amazing. So we see his conversion. That's his occupation. Number two is his conversion in verse number nine. And that is, as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. So it's just a normal day at the office for Matthew, sitting at the table and receiving money or arguing with people about money or how much they owed, whatever it would be, and Jesus comes on the scene. He looks at Matthew, Matthew looks at him, and Jesus says, follow me. And he arose, the Bible says, and followed him. That's it. That's pretty amazing. Uh, that, that is no hesitation. It doesn't seem to be any other dialogue that went on. No, no other, well, now wait a minute, what exactly do you mean by follow me? Now, what exactly, uh, what does this involve? How am I going to live? What's the compensation package? What are the benefits here? I mean, there, there doesn't seem to be any other uh, uh, conversation that goes on. He just simply walks away from the, from the collection booth, so to speak, where he's receiving the taxes, walks away from his profession forever just leaves it now I understand how can he do you understand the fishermen can walk away like the Matt, Peter and James and John because if they ever really needed to they could go back to fishing you don't go back to tax collecting once you quit there are there are too many other men in line that are ready to snatch up your franchise your, your, your spot. You know why? It's very lucrative. So we know that Matthew had at some point in his life had to be very materialistic because this was a lucrative job. This would have been a very, uh, you, know, they, you know, it said about Zacchaeus, he was very rich. That was common among that tax collectors. They didn't get it all honestly, but they, they got a lot of money. And, and so he willingly walks away knowing I can never go back to do this again. There's no, there's no turning back. Once I leave, the bridge is burned. And there's no returning. And how can he do that? How can he, how can he walk away not knowing what the future is going to be? Not knowing how he's going to live. Not knowing how he's going to take care if he has his family or not. There's only one conclusion. Matthew had to have been spiritually hungry. He had to have been searching the Old Testament Scripture. I think, obviously, God was drawing Matthew to him. God had put that in his heart. And, and he knew that, I think he'd heard about Jesus. I think he, he knew what Jesus had done and, and heard some of the things that uh, he had, had taken place. In fact, it's pretty... Pretty obvious that Matthew knew the Old Testament very well. Ninety-nine times the Old Testament is quoted in the book of Matthew. That's more than Mark, Luke, and John all combined. So here's a Jew banned from the temple, banned from sacrifice, not allowed to go there, but who's studying the Scriptures that he had on his own. 
And I think he knew the Scriptures about the Messiah. I think he knew the Scriptures that would talk about the Messiah coming. And I think as he heard about Jesus, I, I believe he was really uh, drawn in his heart that this is the Messiah. He studied on his own. And so when Jesus came by and said, drop everything and follow me, Matthew simply said, okay. And he left it all and began to follow Jesus. It's quite an amazing thing. Can I say this? You never know who God's working on. You never know who God's drawing to Himself. You may look at somebody and say, ah, in his position, with his money, with what he's got, no use saying anything to him. Oh, don't, don't say that. You never know who God's dealing with and who God's working on. This was, this was Matthew's opportunity to be saved and to follow Christ, and he didn't waste it. He took advantage of it. He didn't miss it. Two things I want you to remember about this. Number one is, material possessions will not fully satisfy you. Material possessions will not fully satisfy you. You can get all the, all the money in the world, but it's not going to fill that hole in your heart that only God's going to fill. You can, you can make all the... It's, it's like uh, when Tom Brady won his first Super Bowl and he said, is this all there is? Is it? You know, this is the pinnacle of my profession. That's what led to, uh, supposedly, uh, Deion Sanders making a profession of faith. He just won the Super Bowl with the Cowboys and was named the MVP and got a, got a Corvette, I think it was. And he said he laid in bed that night. And he said that emptiness was still there. And he said, this, this can't be it. There's got to be more to it than this. See, don't, don't think because somebody seems to have a lot. Or they have a lot of this world's good that they're just happy and satisfied. Listen, the world's goods don't satisfy. They won't satisfy you. If there's, it, it just, just, there, there's a hole inside of every human being's heart that only is going to be filled by Jesus Christ. And when you appeal to that and you say that to somebody, I tell you what, it resonates. And, and, and don't, be, don't be ashamed to say that. Then number two is you don't get saved when you are ready. But when God is ready, and God is ready now, God is ready now. I don't think I don't think you have to say, "Well, God wasn't dealing with this person." No, I think God deals with every person. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. When I give the gospel, I don't have to worry about whether the Holy Spirit is dealing or not. I know He is. I know that God wants everyone to come to, to come to Christ, and God wants everyone to be saved, and so. Uh, but listen, you don't come on your time, you come on God's time. You can procrastinate if you want, but there's no guarantee you'll have another opportunity. What does God say in 2 Corinthians chapter 6? Now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Nobody in the Bible that ever put off salvation ever did get saved as far as we know. They, they, the, the day never came. When uh, Was it Festus who said a more convenient time? As far as we know, the more convenient time never came. Agrippa said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. But almost saved is to be totally lost. So, as far as we know, those men never did come to Christ. And sometimes people think, I'll just wait. No, I'm not ready yet. Well, what, what's going to make you ready? You're assuming that you can do it anytime you want. And that's a false assumption. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. I believe hell is full of people who fully intended to get saved. Just not today. Not now. And before they could decide, it's too late. And they died and went to hell. So uh, you don't get saved when you're ready. You get saved when God's ready, and God's ready now. Okay? God's word, God is always now. The devil's favorite word is tomorrow. Okay? When do you want to get rid of these frogs, Pharaoh? Tomorrow. Are you kidding me? Huh? See? No, no, no. Today. Today. All right? Number three, his occupation. We have his conversion.
Christian. Number three, we see his burden to tell others. His burden to tell others. For this, I want you to go to Luke chapter 5. Would you turn over there, please? Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke chapter 5. Again, here is the account Luke gives about the conversion of Matthew and what took place right afterwards. Okay? Luke 5, and notice with me verse 27. And after these things, he went forth, that's Jesus, and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. All right? So right away, Matthew immediately prepares a feast in his house. And he's inviting other people to come. This says a lot about Matthew's faith. He's just following Jesus and he's, he's now invited everybody to come. And you know, it's a, it's a different thing in the Middle East to invite people in for a meal than it is in our country. You know, everybody here at one time or another has been invited to someone's home for dinner and you've turned it down for other things that are going on or your schedule didn't allow it. You, you, that's a huge offense in the Middle East. If you're invited to a meal, you, you go. And so, here's the meal that he's going to have. And, and it says a lot about his faith. And it says, first of all, it, what it says about Matthew's faith is he blessed his home. Notice where he had the feast. In his own house. In his own house. You know what Matthew did? He brought Christ into his home. That's a wonderful thing. He got saved at work, but he brought Christ to his home. You know the first place your faith ought to show up up? is where you live. That's, the, that's where you better be the best Christian is inside the four walls of your own home. And, and live for God. And bring Christ into your home. If your salvation, if your Christianity isn't any good at home, it isn't any good. Make sure you're a Christian at home. It's one thing to put, to put on the, the act in public. It's quite another thing to live it out at home when nobody's watching for you to perform for. See, Matthew not only followed Christ publicly, but he followed Him at home too. Listen, mom and dad, nothing will turn your children off quicker than you being one way at church and another way at home. They'll see that you're a phony. Phony is a $3 bill. And, and so you be real. Be real. Be genuine. Invite Christ into your home. I remember... I believe it was G. Campbell Morgan who was a, a great expositor of another generation. But his son got married and they had set up their own first little apartment and he invited them over to see their, their first place, you know. And he was so proud of it and he showed them through the apartment and, and uh, there seemed to be a concerned look on G. Campbell Morgan's face and his son said, Dad, what's, what's wrong? He said, don't you like our place? He said, no, I like your place fine. He says, but you know what, son? There's nothing anywhere in this home that tells me it's a Christian home. There's no Scripture anywhere. There's no Bible anywhere. There's nothing anybody walking in here would be able to tell this home belongs to Jesus Christ. And he remedied that situation. What about your home? You walk into your home, is it obvious to anyone who would walk in that this home belongs to Jesus Christ? That this is a Christian home. That this, this belongs to the Lord. And we, we worship and serve the Lord here in our house. So Matthew blessed his home. The second thing I see he did was he broadcast his faith. You know, notice it says he made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them. You know, it, it's interesting and of others. You know who the others would have been? Uh, some pretty rough characters. No one else would, would... Who does he know? Only ones he knows are other, other tax collectors. 
no one else will hang around with them. No one else will have anything to do with them. So there would be some pretty rough characters here that are, that are coming to then That's why the scribes and Pharisees are going to complain, and we'll say more about that in a minute. But the great thing is this. Matthew decided he's not going to be in the secret service of Christianity. Okay, there's no sec- He wasn't going to be a secret disciple. Okay? There's no secret service Christians. There's no undercover Christians. I'm incognito. No one knows I'm really a Christian. That's not in the Bible. He was willing to broadcast his faith to others. And remember, this is a tough crowd. This is a crowd that are materialistic. They're dishonest. They, they steal from people. They pad their own pocket. They're selfish. They're looking out for themselves. This is the group he has in to tell them about Jesus. But we also know that quite possibly that one of the ones who came and listened to this might have been a little short guy named Zacchaeus. And that when Jesus finally came to his town, Jericho, Zacchaeus said, I've got to get a closer look at this guy. It very possible could have had an influence on Zacchaeus' conversion. But he has this feast, and the main purpose of the meal, having him in to feed him, is he wants to tell him about Jesus. He wants them to know about his faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe they were all curious as to, hey, I heard, I heard Matthew walked out today. Just walked out? Didn't clean his desk out? Didn't take a box with him? He didn't just walked out, got up and left? Man, I'm sure they're all talking about it. What's going on? Well, hey, look, I got an invitation to come to his house for dinner. You going? You bet I'm going. I'm going to find out what's happened. What, what in the world? Has he lost his mind? What is going on with this guy? And so they all wanted to come and find out. And, and he wanted to tell them that it was Jesus Christ. He wasn't ashamed of that. Whosoever believeth in Him shall not be ashamed. Are you ashamed of Jesus? So do you broadcast your faith? Do you, do you, who's the last person you told about Jesus? It's the last time you just said something about Jesus to somebody. Just to, just to say, you know what? I want everybody to know I'm not ashamed of Him. I'll broadcast my faith. Even if, it's, even if it's bowing your head and praying at a restaurant. Bow your head and pray. People notice that. Don't drop your handkerchief on the table. <laughs> Hope nobody noticed you. Yeah, that was your prayer. You know. No, don't do that. But, but folks, are, don't be ashamed of your prayer. He broadcast his faith. And then we know, thirdly, he was burdened for others. He was burdened for others or he wouldn't have cared about telling these folks about Jesus Christ. You know, one of the great evidences that you're born again is you get concerned about other people, who you care about and who you love. No one who is genuinely going to heaven to heaven alone. You want to take somebody with you. When Andrew found Jesus, his first thought was, Where's Peter? i got to go get my brother. He needs to meet the Messiah. Philip said, I'm going to get Nathaniel. See, right away, somebody they cared about, somebody who they loved, they wanted to tell them about Jesus. And that's the great thing. Listen to me. When you go soul winning and if you see somebody in a house saved, I guarantee you there's other people in that house who need to be saved. There's more than one fish in that pond right there. And, and listen, they all need to hear the gospel and they, should be, they will begin to be concerned about other people in their household. When you get saved, the natural thing is to be concerned about your loved ones. Now, sometimes where we may not, we may be so zealous that sometimes we get a little over the top with them. Anybody have that happen? When you first got saved, you're really zealous and man, you just kind of, Blew him out of the water. And uh, whoa, whoa, you know. And, and, and so you have, to, you, have, you have to be careful in what you, how you approach it. But you, you, the, the great thing is you should have a burden for them. And you should certainly begin to pray that God will open their eyes. That they could see the gospel and they would be saved. And so there should be a concern for your family members, your loved ones, your friends, etc. So he was burdened for others. Well, number four is the opposition to his conversion. You think, man, the guy leaves his job, follows Jesus, has a feast, invites people to come. Verse 30. 
But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? Well, there's your scribes and Pharisees. Always trying to find something wrong. Always trying to be critical. They, they, maybe they were upset they weren't invited, but they wouldn't have gone anyway. They wouldn't have anything to do with somebody like Matthew. And they certainly wouldn't have anything to do with other publicans or people they would call sinners, which was pretty much anybody other than them. Okay, Pharisees were very self-righteous, proud individuals. They were very critical of the disciples and Jesus going into Matthew's home. But Satan always opposes soul winning. Satan always opposes witnessing to others of Christ. Wherever the work of Christ is progressing, the devil is always protesting. Always. Now it's sad when it comes from, quote, religious people, but oftentimes it does. The scribes and Pharisees were proud. They thought they were better than anybody else. They couldn't, they couldn't deny the miracles that Jesus had done. They had to admit he'd done, he'd done the miraculous. They couldn't say anything against it. Their, their issue was they, wouldn't, they, they were never willing to admit they were sinners. We're not, remember the Pharisee and the publican when Jesus used that illustration about prayer? The Pharisee's first words out of his mouth were, Lord, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are. What do you mean by that? I'm better than them. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. I do this. I do that. Look at me. Ain't I something? That's how they look at it. They, they, they would not admit they're sinners. Now let me, let, me help, let me help us tonight, all right? Don't, don't, don't get so caught up that you wear nice clothes and you have a haircut or you have on a skirt or a dress and you carry a King James Bible that you're thinking you're better than anybody else. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay? And I... Uh, don't, don't, get to, don't get to be a Pharisee and say, I thank you, I'm not like those other people. Okay? That's, that's not, you, you we'll read here in a few minutes, some of the most scathing, harsh words Jesus ever uttered were to Pharisees. You don't want any part of that. When, when you get Pharisaical and you say, well, I don't know if I want, you know, those... Those, those are you people. See, then you're wrapping up your pharisaical garments around you saying, I'm not like they, I'm, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not as other men are. Hmm? Now, any, any wicked, vile sin that you hear or see another human being do, you're capable of doing and so am I. We have that same heart. And there, but for the grace of God, that would happen to me. And so we give, listen, it's by the grace of God. Don't become pharisaical. Don't be like the scribes and the Pharisees. You see, if they admit they're sinners, then they have to admit, I need a Savior. I need Jesus. And they weren't about to admit that. See, Jesus knew that, so here's what Jesus said to them. Jesus answering, verse 31, said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know what a physician has to, you know what a physician has to do to make people well? He's got to be around sick people. You know what a person has to do to get people to Jesus? He's got to be around people that are sick in their sin to get them to Jesus. You got to get you got to get down and be with them. You got to be around them. You're not around them to encourage them in their sin. You're not around them to participate in any wrongdoing. You're 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 around them to tell them of the savior. 
who can save them from their sin and deliver them from their sins. You don't want to be so separated as the Pharisees were that they wouldn't even associate or speak to anybody who they thought was a sinner. Don't be like that. Talk to people. They're, they're, every single person is a soul for whom Christ died. And don't forget, one day, that was you. One day, that was me. And somebody talked to you. Somebody cared about you. Somebody didn't, you know, wasn't too, too focused on themselves and how righteous they were that they didn't want to tell you about Jesus. Now I want you to look over at Matthew 23. Matthew chapter 23. I won't go through all of this, but you'll get the gist of it. The whole chapter really is filled with this. I'm just going to pick it up with verse 13. Matthew 23, verse 13. Notice what Jesus says. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, And for a pretense, make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it's nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind... For whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold, and whatsoever and whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing, but whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon the altar, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it and all, by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear... By heaven sweareth by the throne of God, and by him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides which strain in a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye may clean the outside of the cup of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisees, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. And it goes on and on. Boy, he'd be, he wouldn't be a great televangelist, would he? He couldn't even preach that in most Baptist churches today. Pretty, pretty rough words for people who think they're righteous and better than other people. Scathing remarks. God delivers from that kind of an attitude. Now Matthew's gospel that the Lord had him write always presents Jesus as King of the Jews. King of the Jews. Don't don't get your church doctrine out of the book of Matthew. Okay? When when you're you're going to get all messed up. You can get some principles that will help us. but, But we're... The, 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 the things are written in Matthew were written to the Jew. All the, all the Bible is written for us, but not all the Bible is written to us. 
Don't take promises that God gives to Israel and make them for you. You'll make a mistake when you do that. All right? In Matthew 24, the Bible says, He that endures to the end shall be saved. Well, that isn't for you and me. Uh, what's for you and me? Uh, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, that it, gets a, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's for you and me. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We're not going to have to endure to the end. We're going to be caught up and taken out, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But the Jew will have to endure to the end. And you, you, you'll, get, you'll get messed up if you try to apply things that God intended for the Jew to show them that Messiah, Jesus, is their king. The whole, where, does, where does Matthew begin the story? He goes back with the genealogy to Abraham. Hey, he's the, this is the line of Abraham. This is the promised Messiah. And he starts with Jesus, not, not necessarily his birth, but when the wise men came to give him gifts. Why? They're worshiping a king. Why did Herod want to kill Jesus? He doesn't want another king. See, when you get into Matthew, the big complaint was, we will not have this man to rule over us. It's all about him being the king of the Jews. That's Matthew's gospel. Now, history tells us that Matthew ministered in Israel and later in Egypt, Ethiopia, and India until he was martyred for the cause of Christ. Varying accounts on how he was killed, but uh, most of them believe he was cut through with a halberd, H-A-L-B-E-R-D, and it's a, you, you've probably seen it more in cartoons than you have anything else, and, oh, don't look at me that way, you watch cartoons, and... Um, <laughs> People look at me real pious, like, I never saw it. it it's an axe, axe front, but it has a, a, another thing coming back this way. And he was cut through for his faith in Jesus Christ. All of the disciples met death by martyrdom because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Matthew, just an unlikely disciple. One that maybe maybe because of his background, stayed in the shadows and stayed back. But faithful and reliable, and it's interesting that the Lord would choose him to pen the first gospel. And a gospel that would be to the Jews to show that he is the king of the Jews. And would use Matthew to do that, a one who would have been despised in their eyes as a publican. Uh, but God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Aren't you glad he does? Because that gives you and I some hope. Amen? Well, let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, thank you for Matthew. Thank you for his faithfulness to you. Thank you, Lord, for his conversion. Thank you, Lord, for his burden to tell others about his faith in Christ and to see others know who Jesus was. Lord, I pray that despite the opposition that he faced, that he continued, he was faithful. Even 20 years after you went to heaven, he penned the Gospel of Matthew. Traveled on out into Egypt and Ethiopia and India until he died for the cause of Christ. Look forward to seeing Matthew someday. Hearing more about his time that he spent with you. Hearing more about that day, he just got up and left it all and followed you. Lord, I pray that you would help each of us. Some tonight think, I, I don't think I could be Peter. I don't think I could be John or James. But Lord, maybe you'll touch the heart of somebody tonight and say, you know what, I can just be Matthew. I can be in the shadows. I can stay in the background. But I can be faithful to Christ. I'll tell others about him. I'll, I'll forsake all and follow Him. And I'll be loyal and dependable and faithful. And be true to the Master. Help us to be like Matthew. Lord, dismiss us now with Your care. Thank You again for Pastor Han and what You're doing there through him in the Philippines. Prosper his ministry, Lord. Meet every need that he has. I pray the building will get finished. I pray... The pastor will take over. I pray he can move to another city and your hand will be upon him there as well. 
Many souls will come to know you as their Savior as a result of his labors there. Be with his family as they're apart from one another. Keep them safe and watch over them. Protect them while they're away. And Lord, give us a, a good Wednesday evening now. Dismiss us with your care. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.